welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. MacroHive helps educate investors and provide investment insights for all markets from crypto to equities to bonds. For our latest views, visit MacroHive.com. Greetings, uh, Julia. It's fantastic to have you on the podcast show. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Great. Now, before we go into the heart of our conversation, I do like to ask all of my guests something about their origin story. So, <laughs> Um, perhaps you can start with what you studied at university and whether it was inevitable you'll enter into academia and politics and, and studying politics. Yeah, I think, you know, I'll start with um, I studied political science in college with the intention of, of becoming a journalist, probably. Uh, but you couldn't go straight into the journalism program at the University of Illinois, at least at that time. So I started um, I didn't want to come in undeclared. I wanted to, you know, be focused and. That kind of, I was sort of coming from that kind of uh, background, and I really fell in love with the idea that there are these big theories about how the world works, and you can use them to explain different things. But I think it was even maybe even more inevitable than that because I do remember this moment um, in the, you know probably the mid nineteen eighties when I was a very small child, and my mom was trying. I was pestering her with some question or another, and my mom was trying to explain things to me, and she said, "Well, I'm a Democrat." But Granny, her, her mom, my grandmother, who, who lived with us, is a Republican. And I sort of was like, what? How can that be? How, what does that mean? And so and my mom was the kind of mom who would not, you know, she didn't like break it down for me like I was a little kid, even though I was. She said, well, I, you know, I don't agree with the Republicans foreign policy. Like, I had no idea what that meant. But, um, you know, I was so fascinated. Like, how can people, you know, these two most important people in my life be different things? And I think that really set off a kind of lifelong fascination. And when the 2000 election hit, so kind of right in the middle of when I was doing my undergrad, I became really fascinated with all of these different pieces of, of the American elections process. And I decided that around that time, I didn't really want to do politics, but I wanted to study and analyze it. So that's, that's sort of my origin story. Yeah. And then you stayed in academia, was it, after that? And yeah. in political science. I did, yeah. So I finished my, my undergraduate degree at, in political science and went straight uh, into a PhD at Yale University. And I uh, got this job at Marquette in Milwaukee. I just have interest. What was your PhD on? Yeah. Just out of interest. Um, so it was also on political science, it was the basis for my first book, Delivering the People's Message. So it was on presidential mandate claiming. And I think the the other the other element of this actually that really shaped my my perspective was being in graduate school during the George W. Bush administration. And just around the time that I needed to figure out what I was going to do, and I had so many different interests, and it's like everything you should not do in a PhD of doing, being interested in so many different things, that I was really interested in the 2004 election and the way that Bush was sort of framing it as a mandate election. And so that really became the basis for uh, my dissertation, which was called Delivering the People's Message, which was about the conditions under which presidents point to election results to justify what they're doing and then that became my first book and that which was published in 2014 and then the most interesting case of election interpretation and in that book happened two years after it was published in 2016 um but because i had had to you know uh shoot my own horn here but it, because i had developed that framework i think that really gave me a good set of analytical tools to think about the long uh, impact the long shadow of the 2016 election on American politics. But to close the the biographical piece of this, um, I, I uh, started on faculty here in a tenure track position at Marquette University in in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and that is where I've been ever since. And Wisconsin's in, uh, an interesting state as well in terms of elections. It seems to uh, it seems to decide elections generally. It is never. It is never a dull moment here, and it, we not only are we nationally decisive, we have a lot of really close uh, local elections. We had a judicial uh, state supreme court race last year that uh, you know gripped much of the nation. It didn't turn out to be very close, uh, but we yes, it's it's never a dull up moment and down the balance. <laughs> it's it's consistent. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, so just just following on from some of your research, then. Um, 
you know, there is this question in the US about presidential power and just the separation of power. And, you know, at least since the, uh, you know, since the creation of modern America, the idea was to not be a monarchy like the Brits, uh, like, like, you know, the great, you know, the UK. Um, and so UK, so, so the US created a whole system of checks and balances in all sorts of different ways. And the idea was not to have too much power in the hands of mm -hmm. the president. Now, how how has that kind of, you know, how has that held up in, in recent decades, mm -hmm. you would say? Um, and what, what are some, you know, the, the key milestones that we should think about in terms of presidential power? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, I think that the way to actually break this down is to think about foreign policy power and war power on the one hand and domestic policy power on the other hand. And both of these have increased. And so I just to give like a really um, kind of basic breakdown, I think that the the turning point on domestic policy happens around the 1930s with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So this will be a, a familiar story for anyone who who does follow American history. But for for folks who don't, um, basically, that's you have the New Deal, you have the creation of what we call the administrative state. So it's a lot of um, enforcement of federal domestic policy that kind of comes out of the executive branch. At the same time that that's happening, you also see um, with with FDR, the president kind of becoming the leader of his party in a more meaningful way and becoming a more with the advent of radio and Roosevelt's use of it, you see the president becoming more of a leader of public opinion. So that's a really big watershed on the domestic side. On the, the foreign policy side, that it's really kind of around the same time, the national security state emerges out of World War II and then um, after after the Vietnam War, there's a very controversial piece of legislation called the War Powers Resolutions, passed over Richard Nixon's veto in 1973. And this piece of legislation has sort of says the president can send troops if there are hostilities, that the president can send troops on his own to that place where the hostilities are taking place. He has to report to Congress within 24 hours. And then has 60 days to either have a declaration of war or other authorization, or then has 30 days to bring the troops home. And so critics of this, there are critics kind of on both sides of the aisle or on both sides of the question. It's not always, it doesn't always break down on down party lines. Um, but on the one hand, presidents have objected to this because they said it actually limits the president's power as commander in chief. And critics of presidential war power have also said, you know, basically this spells out a way for the president to send troops places around the globe where the constitution intends for that kind of action to your point about monarchy always to originate with congress so it everybody hates it it's not it, its impact is sort of difficult to assess um but that also i think is a is kind of a, a crucial turning point in thinking about the president having the ability to involve the country in conflicts around the world um, in ways that don't quite rise to the level of, of um, they definitely don't rise to the level of a declared war, and sometimes they don't even quite rise to the level of a sort of fully, um, fully fledged military operation um, that's been authorized by Congress. So those are sort of the watersheds, and then the Bush administration is yet another kind of watershed of the president really owning um, that power, and of course, of the United States being involved globally. Uh, particularly in these areas in the Middle East that have really defined candidacies and presidencies ever since. So that's, um, I'm hoping at some point. That's great. That I finish. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to just ask on the, on the, on the war powers then, because the, my understanding was Congress has to approve wars. So this, yep. this, this act that occurred, you know, during the Nixon sort of period, mm -hmm. that kind of, as you say, it's ambiguous. I mean, it, it kind of yeah. says, yes, Congress does, but on the other hand, no, it doesn't. Um, and so, for example, with George Bush uh, Jr., like number two, mm -hmm. like the Iraq War, the Afghanistan War, was there congressional approval for that? I mean, what was the evolution to start those wars? Yeah, so there was congressional approval. Um, there, there's essentially, like, you can kind of think of it in three buckets, the sort of three categories. Yeah. Um, so there's declared wars, of which the United States hasn't had since World War One or World War II, excuse me. Um, so there's that kind of war. And then there's a the military authorization. So in 2001, 
Um, after the September 11th attacks, Congress passed the authorization of the use of military force. It gives the president rather broad authority um, to use military force in areas where the war, the global war on terror is involved. Um, and similarly, and there was also a, a congressional authorization of military action in Iraq, but not a declaration of war. And then there's this third category where um, that is created by the War Powers Act. That's sort of these, you know, the president can send can send troops, these sort of um, other ty- types of military operations uh, that are initiated by the president. And then in this in this gray area status until that 60 day um, window closes. But it's that's, there are the more. It seems to have ahead. a lot of power here. It seems like. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, especially, I mean, the president is sort of setting the agenda, but the other piece to this is really is informal, right? And that I think really speaks to these military authorizations under um, George W. Bush in the wake of 9 11, which is what the president is doing is setting the public agenda in this arena. And this is where I'm hoping at some point to write a book that really um, engages with how George W. Bush shaped the presidency in the 21st century. Um, and His kind of way of defining what had happened on 9-11 and what the response would be became very, like, deeply ubiquitous in a way that's it's hard actually to think of in American politics now um, because there was quite a bit of of bipartisan agreement about what these attacks meant and sort of what that meant for um, the power of the commander in chief. And when the president has that kind of hold on political narratives, it really expands what what they can do um even you know regardless of all these legal complexities that's that's really you know congress finds it difficult to act i think independently when the president has already established the political meaning of something yeah i guess this goes back to your point earlier about fdr and how he started to become like this uh identifies the leader of the party using the radio so suddenly all all the agenda setting can be held within the president has that that power, so to speak, in terms of communications and and his uh, and the office that he has. Exactly, and it's it's subtle, right? Political scientists have done a lot of analysis, and they find you know the president doesn't speak, and then public opinion just shifts on a dime. But when something new happens, and people are sort of kind of searching for a political definition for it, the president has an advantage over Congress. The president has has more of capacity. I mean, obviously, he can sort of speak with one voice congress is always going to be 535 people uh, more or less uh that that can't necessarily come up with a kind of unified counter narrative yeah and and obviously under george uh, bush jr he also introduced the patriot act as well and so that you know is is a domestic policy um in terms of Mm -hmm. the ability for the federal government to surveil its domestic population I mean, how would you view something like that in terms of, is that linked to presidential power or is that something else? Yeah, I mean, this is a little bit out of my my area of expertise. Um, I don't do a lot on like, kind of in-depth security or surveillance or whatever. I, most of this, I mean, it comes out of the executive branch, right? Any, mm. any sort of enforcement comes out of the executive branch. So I would, I would argue that that's an enhancement of certainly of presidential, um, of presidential power. I would also note that the Patriot Act had been sort of tumbling around um, mm prior to 9-11, but it sort of found its political moment at that um, at that point. And that was another moment. Maybe that's how, this will never happen again, where the president is able to, to uh, develop a narrative and Congress is just sort of unable to um, effectively create a counter narrative. One of the elements of polarization is that it does in some weird ways check presidential power. Yes. And, and um, you know, bringing uh, this to here and now, under what circumstances can a president be sort of demoted or taken out? You know, like I, I recall, mm-hmm. and Trump is bringing all of these questions to light. So when he was in power, mm-hmm. some people were talking about using the Constitution or the amendments to the Constitution mm-hmm. to say that he was unfit to be in office. Now, currently, obviously, there's the indictments where people are saying that you can use the 14th Amendment to uh, disqualify Trump. Um, because he's, you know, viewed as an insurrectionist. So what what are some of the constitutional elements in terms of removing the president or how how does that curtail the power of a president? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's start with the original text um, of the Constitution and the original articles, and that's impeachment, a topic that is, um, 
you know, one that we've talked quite a lot about in the Trump yeah. years. Um, and also the subject of a book that I'm um, should be working on right now. So impeachment is you know, it's it's pretty ambiguous. It says the president can be um, impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors. No one has ever really figured out what that meant. <laughs> but the real thing about impeachment is that the threshold for conviction is very high. So you have to get two thirds of the Senate to vote to convict a president. And that has just never happened. It ha it came close in the 1860s, but because of partisan polarization, it neither of Trump's um, impeachments came close. Although I should note the second one, um, 57 votes. There were 57 votes in the Senate to convict, which is um, a pretty you know a pretty substantial majority, even though it doesn't meet that threshold. And of course, part of that story is that Trump had already left office. But impeachment is not proven to be an effective way of removing the president from office. We could debate more about whether it's an effective kind of tool for limiting presidential power in this kind of softer sense. The other president, excuse me, the other constitutional piece is the 25th Amendment. This was ratified in, uh, I think, 1967 and um, kind of the wake of a number of unfortunate health events for presidents, including the assassination of John F. Kennedy and the prospect that he would essentially hang on in a, in a coma or unconscious, unconscious um, for some time. That didn't end up happening, but there were a lot of questions about kind of what do you do if the president has a stroke, gets shot, has a heart attack, um, which is a, a problem with Dwight Eisenhower, um, and is incapacitated and can't govern. Who's in charge? So you know, what do you do? And members in Congress spent a lot of time kind of hammering that out and came up with a section of the 25th Amendment on presidential removal that is just, you know, is totally insane. Um, and I've written about this at 538, and there's a, a book called uh, Constitutional Cliffhangers that has this sort of fictional scenario that's also pretty wild. But essentially, a majority of the cabinet can say that the president is incapable of discharging his duties. And okay, if he's in a coma, then he's probably not going to object. But if you suspect that the president is having a, some sort of mental health event, then and they're up and walking around, then they can object. And there's it's not totally clear what happened to that point. And you can have two cabinets and you can have two presidents. And this is sort of Brian Kloss is the historian, uh, legal historian who fleshes this out and, um, it, you know, draws up this wild scenario. So this is this came up a number of times during Trump's presidency. The most, um, I think, sort of prominent was after January 6th, but it was bandied about before then because I know I know that I wrote this 538 explainer uh, well before January 6th. I mean, it's just, it's yet another scenario where there's a lot of ambiguity and it's missing some crucial mechanisms. And so it's just not clear how how presidential removal under the 25th Amendment would work um, in in those types of scenarios. So that's probably that's probably more words than it even deserves mm. as an explanation but again i guess it's because of the cabinet, cabinet it's the cabinet's affiliated to the party i mean president picks the cabinet so yeah it, at some level that you know it's it's harder to constrain mm -hmm. the president there versus say impeachment mm -hmm. where if you if senate was the majority held by the opposition party that that could potentially you could see a path there where the president could be impeached mm -hmm. and convicted um, yeah, I mean to to clarify, there's also the Twenty Fifth Amendment also has a uh, a thing, a provision where Congress can create a specific commission for this um, to to remove the president. And also, the the thing with impeachment is no president has ever been impeached by his own party. Um, it's always been divided government. Hmm. The trick is that it's very unusual for for one party to hold two thirds of the seats. Or for a president to have alienated substantial numbers of his own party, <laughs> um, Richard Nixon was probably close, right? That's that's why he resigned because senators from the Republican Party said we will we will vote for your conviction because the evidence is just really strong that you've really crossed an important line. And then, how about the Fourteenth Amendment? This is the one that everyone's talking about now, um, which uh, I suppose relates to insurrectionists, or if if, if someone's uh, associated with that. Yeah, so the 14th Amendment is a post-Civil War amendment, and it's it's also the one that, that deals with equal protection. It sort of lays out um, what the, in, in 
kind of the strongest terms, I think, in the Constitution, what this post-Civil War world is going to look like. And like the other pieces of the Constitution we've talked about, there's the text and then there's the sort of enforcement and reality. So Section 3 of the 14th Amendment says that if you've held public office and then you've engaged in an insurrection, you are not qualified to hold pub- public office again. So it only applies to people who are serving in office. And I should also say, you know, there were some people were disqualified for this um, after the Civil War. Some high level members of the Confederacy also held office. Um, so it hasn't been it hasn't had super strong teeth, even in its original context. And there's a group that's been um, been sort of pursuing disqualification of lower level office holders because of January 6th. And they have succeeded in, in getting some people disqualified. Some, I think there's a, like a judge in uh, New Mexico, things like that. So it's not that this is totally untested. The one of the tricky things about this section of the 14th Amendment is that it does not mention the president or the vice president. And so one of the <laughs> one of the legal debates is does it apply to the president? And I've been in the room with a whole bunch of lawyers who were debating about this. And the debate essentially came down to, it has a long list of offices that are eligible and it doesn't include presidents. That's probably not an accident versus everyone else in the room saying that's insane. So that's basically, um, so, so the debate. section three of the amendment lists public offices, like lists. It does. Oh, okay. And so by the absence of, the president, then that implies that maybe it doesn't apply to the president. Whereas right. the, the principle, the thrust of it is, you know, if you're a public officer of any kind, I suppose, right. then, yeah, so that's the debate. Right. And I mean, and it's, and it, you know, focuses on this sort of constitutional officer element. And this is a substantial um, kind of chunk of Article 2 uh, that establishes the presidency in the U.S. Constitution is about the about the constitution about the role of preserving the constitution about the oath of office so to to argue i mean people my people i mean lawyers argue sort of is the the president a an officer of or under the constitution um i i don't think i'm alone in thinking that whatever else of this amendment is to have any sort of teeth whatsoever i mean it has to apply to the president that's the, the idea that the president isn't an officer of the Constitution to me seems absurd. And I'm, as I said, I'm not alone, but the textual evidence is not there. Hmm. And so in practice, then, I mean, do you think, I mean, what's your, what's your guess for this year in terms of indictments and uh, President Trump being disqualified? Of course, on, on some states have already uh, dropped him from their ballots. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what's your take on this this route to affect Trump uh, in 2024? Well, there's a couple more things. Another one of the legal issues that that uh, comes up in this um, in this question is uh, the, the big one is is what constitutes participating in an insurrection, and one of the pieces of that is potentially a conviction. The timeline is not is not in favor of that. It is. It seems unlikely that if Trump were to be convicted in one of the two trials that he's facing that are related to his role in January 6th and a larger, um, I think, kind of effort to subvert the 2020 election that is in some ways more important, those verdicts are unlikely to come out before the Supreme Court will make its decision. So the the Supreme Court is taking up the case of Trump's ballot disqualification. He's been disqualified by the Colorado Supreme Court. Colorado, I should note, is a state where Trump's not very likely to carry its not very large number of electoral college votes. And he's also been disqualified by the Secretary of State in Maine in kind of a unique and unusual process. Here in the United States, election law is left to the states. But every state does it a little differently. And Maine does a lot of things differently. Trump is likely to win. So Maine has three electoral college votes and they, they're one of the states that can split them. So, um, you know, Trump is maybe likely to win one electoral college vote in Maine. So these are not high stakes um, tickets for him to be on. The concept that he would be on some ballots and not others is not crazy in the broader context of American politics, but is a little bit destabilized things um in the in the you know the context of 2024 
it seems likely to me that the Supreme Court will rule very narrowly on this, that they'll rule that because there's insufficient evidence of Trump's role in the insurrection because of the lack of conviction or they'll which would be controversial or their rule that Congress has to pass a law in order for the Section three of the 14th Amendment to be operative, which is another legal debate. They'll they'll I think they'll dodge the question and try to rule in a technical way. But I could be wrong. And some pretty major commentators, including some conservatives, think that this court is um, not very Trump sympathetic and might might rule a different way. So that's and this can um, happen before November. Um, yeah, I mean, it'll sort of have to happen before November. Yeah. Typically, the Supreme Court announces their decisions in June, and this might be sooner. Um, I know this is this is the sort of thing where we've got the court, we've got yeah. 51 different jurisdictions making uh, voting on the president, American politics, giving everybody a headache. Um, and that, if he was that, become president, could he be convicted of insurrection from... Uh, 2020 or not? Yeah, I mean, there's well, the courts also um, hearing that right this this question of presidential immunity. I don't think that this is they're likely to rule that the president has immunity. Although there's a, a sort of standing legal norm that the sitting president is immune from prosecution, but it's okay. not an it's not an ironclad situation. Yeah. Actually, we'll, we'll come back to presidential yeah. powers in relation to Trump a bit later in our conversation. But sure. um, in terms of, I, I, I did also want to talk about parties, political parties as well. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, how's the relationship between the political parties and the president changed? Because obviously we now have mm -hmm. this primary system, which, which kind of, you know, almost disintermediates the, sort of the political party engine from picking the mm -hmm. leader who will then become... Mm -hmm the the president i mean has this always been the case or what 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 was the key turning point for this the key turning point in presidential nominations that that people always point to is the late 60s which is where we kind of get the the presidential primary system that we have now so the kind of conventional wisdom story is that this is a story of the democratic party and the divide over the vietnam war in 1968, you had a pretty dramatic and pretty violent clash at the convention in Chicago between between anti-war protesters who wanted a different candidate and the kind of party establishment, which wanted Hubert Humphrey, who was the sitting vice president and kind of associated with the Johnson administration, which was the uh, the face of the war, the Lyndon Johnson administration. So after that, there was this sort of effort to make the delegate selection process more small d democratic, more open, more inclusive of young people, more inclusive of women, more inclusive of minorities. And a lot of this was implemented at, through state legislatures, which meant that it applied to the Republicans as well. That's essentially, that's essentially the story. And I think it's important to note that American Party... Uh, presidential nominations still have th the same structure that they had in the 1830s, more or less, which is that you have uh, delegates that come to the convention that represent a state that are selected by some state level process, but now is mostly by primaries, and then they vote on the floor. The meaning of each stage of that process has changed and how the delegates are selected has changed. But the the reforms in the late 60s, which were called the the McGovern Fraser uh, Commission and report were never intended for this to be a, a fully direct democracy. They were intended to make the delegate selection process more more inclusive. And over time, I think Americans have come to expect more and more direct input and more and more direct democracy. And those demands are layered on top of an institutional system that comes from a different era and has a sort of different set of um, kind of built-in logics of how politics operates. That, I think, helps a lot to understand our primary madness. <laughs> so I guess in theory, what could happen is somebody could vote in the primary and the delegates could actually pick a different candidate to be leader. That, that could have happened mm -hmm. in earlier times, but today that doesn't or can't happen. So it, this, this is the other super annoying answer. It sort of varies by party and by state. Okay. Um, so for I know this the the real challenge of American politics is that every all the election rules ultimately come down to each state can do slightly different things. 
But here's an example that people may remember. In 2016, the Republicans in um, from Colorado, they have a, their state laws or the state party bylaws have a sort of moral objection clause. And so there was a brief moment of thinking about, well, are these delegates going to cast their votes against Trump, even though that's actually not what they've been instructed to do? And on the Democratic side, and is sort of understood as a preference primary. Part of that is because it's very rare that all the candidates who appear on the ballot will actually still be in the running in the convention. So typically what will happen is, say, um, you know, Ron DeSantis won a certain number of delegates in Iowa. What will happen is typically a candidate who's dropped out will release their delegates and then they're allowed to vote for the eventual winner. So by the time the convention rolls around, there isn't a lot of competition usually. So that's, I know that's confusing. Um, it's, you can imagine. And I recall <laughs> what is, in the... Like to move, I, here. Yeah, I, I recall <laughs> with the Hillary Clinton, uh, yeah. Bernie Sanders case, at, at least the Bernie sort of side of the camp felt they were, there was a stitch up, you know, at the DNC level um, in terms of uh, Hillary being sort of picked. I mean, can you talk, more to what yeah. was what was his objection or his you know like affiliates uh, objection and, yeah, and yeah, whether yeah. it was valid or not absolutely i also want to point out this is second this is the second time in my life that i've been talking about convention politics with a british person and they've used the phrase stitch up which we don't have here in the oh, united sorry. states okay <laughs> that's okay but it's it's actually a perfect description uh i wish we had a phrase like that but it's uh, yeah it's uh it means sort of like a uh controversy right or it was yeah, rigged yeah. or stolen yeah yeah so i had i had to ask the first time but yeah so to add more complexity more fuel to the fire the democratic party has something called um unpledged delegates or more informally they're called super delegates and this was um these were created in the early 1980s after the mcgovern fraser reforms then the party kind of thought oh you know whoa 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 what has gotten out of control uh, we need a little bit more party control from the top. So they created these unpledged delegates. And it's, it's a matter of debate whether they've ever made much difference. But these are typically people who are, um, you know, current or former office holders. They're uh, party, you know, they're kind of party people. And in 2016, people who have been in the Democratic Party for a long time were mostly in favor of Hillary Clinton, you know, for a variety of reasons. And not as much Bernie Sanders. That's changed a little bit. I should say Bernie Sanders has, you know, ha now has some serious party kind of um, play. But, you know, he's, he's an independent. He caucuses with the party, but he hasn't really been a Democrat. And I don't think people in those positions saw him as particularly competitive candidate. And so the superdelegates were overwhelmingly in favor of Hillary Clinton. And I think to some eyes, that looked really anti-democratic and i think that there are a lot of valid debates about how we choose candidates and who has input i don't think super delegates are actually the biggest threat to that i think the calendar is the biggest threat to that and the fact that early states have so much influence um but you know i think there are debates to be had i don't think that there's any evidence that anything happened that was not in accordance with established rules and practices. And that's an important part of democracy too, is that you agree on the rules before you before you get started. I do think that parties parties want to nominate who they want to nominate. And we can have sort of debates about who is who is in the party and who's exercising the most power in that process and whether it's it's open enough. I think that's really debatable. Um and that obviously speaks to the, the Clinton Sanders phenomenon. And actually, if we bring it to the here and now, um, we have this odd situation where um, South Carolina will be the first primary for Democrats this year in mm -hmm. 2024. But New Hampshire's, for some reason, it has something in its its uh, statute to say they always have to go first. So they're they're having one uh, today, I think, for the Democrats. Um, and this is uh, Tuesday, 23rd of, of January. Um, so will that provide some kind of problem for Biden if he's not a formal name on, on the ballot? I, I think we'll see. I think there's a big write-in campaign going on there, and I don't know that 
um, how successful it's it's going to be because Biden is not formally on the ballot. Um, I do think there's this. The formal dimensions of this are unlikely to matter very much. Um, you know, Biden doesn't have any serious competitors. He will win the Democratic nomination, barring some unforeseen issue. Um, but I think it does actually speak to some larger problems that the Democratic Party keeps kicking down the, uh, down the road. And one is that the reason for all of this is in 2020, Biden did quite poorly in Iowa and New Hampshire to the point that um, it really looked like his candidacy was in a lot of trouble and then had a huge resurgence in South Carolina and then subsequently on what we call Super Tuesday. And what's kind of driving that is Biden's real core of support in the Democratic Party is black voters and particularly older black voters. And New Hampshire is not a very diverse state. This has been a source, kind of a sore point in the Democratic Party for some time. There's a reason that South Carolina and also Nevada have become um, more prominent in the primary process. Iowa and New Hampshire are, you know, have like 15 minorities uh, between them living there. And the Democratic Party is, you know, any any point 40 to 50 percent made up of um, kind of racial ethnic and religious minorities that's become increasingly in congress on the other hand when this decision was made first of all it just looks like the president as we talk about like the president being in charge of the party right the president <laughs> blatantly punishing states where he did badly and rewarding ones where he did well in a moment where there's not very high stakes which in some some ways kind of makes it worse um so there's that problem. And it also, I think, was received as this, you know, Democrats by turning away from the importance of Iowa and New Hampshire are, are turning away from rural voters and that that's going to damage their electoral competitiveness. And also, I think, implied sort of their, their broader credibility. So this is a, a problem within the Democratic Party that's not very easy to solve which is, does a party that's about half racial and ethnic minority, and so by extension about half white, you know, does it try to make sure that it's reaching out to white voters who might be on the fence, um, white voters who were attracted to the party because of the way that it understood itself in the 70s or the 40s, or, you know, other previous iterations, um, or in this more post-1970s way that's more invested in minority issues and um, and identity issues. And I don't know, I don't know how hard this is to work out in practice because there's any number of issues that people all care about, but it's it has emerged as kind of a tension in the in the Democratic Party. I mean, that that kind of goes to the point that I suppose many people view Democrat the Democratic Party as a party which has this like broad coalition of sort of contending interests and it's it's hard to pull everyone together. Now, does the Republican Party have the same? I mean, people seem to sort of say Republican Party doesn't have as many coalition issues, but is that is that fair to say that or not? You know, I kind of go back and forth on this question. On the one hand, the Democrat so the Republican Party is sort of on the most superficial level, it's it's not as demographically diverse, right? It's it's far wider. People in the Republican Party are far more likely to be Christian, um, Protestant, church going. On the other hand, though, it is still it is still sort of cobbling together a couple different groups. And you do see those tensions bubble to the surface at times, right? Like business interests and evangelicals are not always going to necessarily be on the same page. I have this theory, though, that what happens in the Republican Party, and this goes back a long, a long time, is that it just it can't tolerate kind of factional disagreement. Democrats have long had factions that have much deeper disagreements than what they have now. And that the Republican Party was forged, I think it's important to note, um, around the issue of slavery. And I know this doesn't seem super relevant right now. But it was it was forged in a sort of moral sense and with this sort of sense that there is a moral boundary on what it means to be a Republican. And even though the party has changed a lot, I think that that's that's continued. And so when there's an insurgent faction, that faction almost always just ends up taking over and it kind of can't tolerate um, that sort of uh, factional dissent the way the Democrats can. 
So that's that's sort of my my theory about that. Yeah, no, no that's fair. Um, and then, then you know, the, the other question, and this is something you've talked about, the politics of, of um, a revelation. Um, I mean, what, what do you mean by that? And, and why, why, why have you brought this up as, as, as something for us to think about? Yeah, this actually kind of goes back to my obsession with how people interpret the 2016 election. That what there's a sort of dominant frame now in the way people do political commentary where you take an event you take people's responses to the event and you say, well, this is this shows us something that was actually there all along. That's what I mean by the politics of revelation. And the reason that I wrote that, so I wrote that, I think, after the first round of Trump indictments um, at, at Politico. And the reason I wrote that is because I think that when you look closely at public opinion on things like January 6th and what should happen to Trump, and also this um, emergent uh, you know, documents at Mar-a-Lago case, I do think that people are still reacting to events. I do think that not everything that happens in politics is simply like, do, I don't know if you all have kind of lottery tickets in the UK and you scratch something we off do. and you see the numbers. Yep. Okay. Um, I figured, but you never know. You never know. Yeah. Uh, um, so... Right. Like it, politics isn't just like scratching off the silver bit and, and seeing what the numbers are underneath that that it, it actually can be dynamic and people actually can respond to new information or be receptive to framing and conceptualizing things in a new way. And and so I think that we have this tendency in our politics right now. There's this very prominent book about the 2020 election that characterizes it as ossified. Right. Everything is partisan. Everyone is partisan, which is which is objectively false. And there's simply, you know, there's no movement. Nothing will ever change. Information doesn't change I mean, anybody's you, you mind. That basically, um, yeah, it's, it's false. The partisanship. Yeah. But wait, can you elaborate on that? That's that was an interesting objection you have there. Yeah. So I mean, people again, there's sort of arguments about independents, how many independents are truly independent versus they just don't want to admit they're partisans. But a substantial number of people don't really pay that much attention to politics at all and aren't, aren't invested in, you know, in particularly in either party. Um, or they have a party label, but it doesn't mean as much to them as it means to some other people. So often when we're talking about what goes on in American politics and the the depth of the you know hatred among partisans or the way that everything is partisan, we are mostly talking about a segment of the electorate and it's highly attuned to politics and really cares about this stuff. And most people are making sense of it alongside a number of other concerns and considerations that they have. Okay. Okay. Understood. Yeah. So so I, I interrupted you there where you talked about 2020 at Ossified uh existing uh sort of um views yeah. of people. Yeah, I mean I wouldn't say this is the most you know fluid American politics has ever been, far from it. But but there is room for some change and some fluidity. And through the through the first two or so years of the Biden administration, we saw some evidence of that. I mean we saw some bipartisan legislation, some pretty big bipartisan legislation. Um and we also saw um, the 2022 midterms, which really defied people's understanding of what goes on in a midterm election. Biden was relatively unpopular. And yet we did not see Republicans gain 30 to 40 House seats as models would predict under those conditions. We They gained, I think, eight. And so, you know, the arguments for that are many. It could be about candidates it could be about where some of these candidates stood on the democracy issue there were some very extreme candidates from the republican party um on kind of election you know the peaceful transfer of power and how elections should be run but and there was also the the Dobbs decision in 2022 that overturned roe versus wade and really changed the face of abortion politics it could be any combination of those things but it does suggest that people are responsive to events that and that, you know, we're not just all responding to a kind of set of partisan culture war cues that are intended to rile people up based on feelings that they already have. But that's what I meant by the politics of revelation, that we're not always just learning things, that things actually can change mm -hmm. in substantive ways.
Okay, no, that's a very fair point. So now, if we move to the here, here and now, um, you know, we have an election this year, of course. Um, uh, let's start with Biden and the Democrats. I mean, Biden, you know, seems unpopular. I mean, do you think he is surprisingly unpopular given the state of the economy, or or not? I mean, first of all, let's start with that point. Yeah, that's 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 the question. Um, there are sort of well, I will say there are t- there are two questions bubbling around in these sort of analytical circles. One is, what is the reason for not only that Biden is unpopular, but the perceptions of the economy are not all very good, even though it's very good on objective measures? I don't have an answer to either of those. Um, I think that there is something to the argument of a kind of broader COVID hangover in the country. I think that we haven't you know, people are not free of the of the illness, and there's really no set of policies that is particularly satisfying, maybe to a majority of Americans. And um, so that's been, I think, really kind of challenging for Biden. I'll just add one one other thing. I yeah. would say, I mean, yeah. I'm speaking more as an economist here, is that I do think that the inflation that we've had, in fact, that price levels have gone up so much and not come down. So even though the inflation rate has come down, mm-hmm. the price level remains very high. And we've done some analysis where you find that price levels and consumer confidence seem to have a relationship with each other. So the fact that the, you know, the sticker shock is still there, you go into Starbucks and it's the price of mm-hmm. your cappuccino has remained very high, um, that, that affects, doesn't make people feel as good about the economy as, as it did in, in the past. I think that's yeah. I think that's probably that's probably right. I didn't know that about the linkage between uh, price levels and consumer confidence, but that uh, of course makes a lot of sense. I do think there's a couple other pieces of the Biden story that are not economic, and I've got some standing disagreements with other with other political scientists about these. But I think that one is that Biden isn't very representative of the Democratic coalition, as I was kind of saying before. This is always a little tricky, right? This is a party that is wholly dependent on the votes of the young, of people of color, uh, increasingly of Americans who identify as LGBTQ, he, you know, Biden of women. Um, and Biden is you know, kind of not any of those things. <laughs> he's an old and, white man. <laughs> yes, yes, he's an old white man. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I think that that's fine. Um, and But th- that was part of kind of the story of his nomination was that he was selected because it seemed like because people were scared right because because people were scared that the the Clinton election had been because of a combination of voters being scared off by a woman and then backlash from the first African American president i don't know that the evidence is totally with that and i think it's crucial to remember that clinton actually won the popular vote but what, for whatever reason that really i think bolstered biden but then he's just not very reflective of the of the coalition and he's never been especially kind of relatedly he's never been especially charismatic he's never been an especially smooth speaker and we know there's reasons for that he has you know he's long suffered from a stutter and he's clearly kind of a behind the scenes politician he clearly knows how legislation works he knows the issues presidency scholars that i know have been much more you know more positive on the biden presidency than um than regular people um <laughs> But his, you know, he's just not a great public president. And I think what we're learning is that that's more important than people thought. He hasn't done a great job offering kind of counter definition at a time when a lot of things are in flux and people are sort of looking for ways to define what's going on. I think there is a sort of there's a pro-democracy majority in this country that is cross-partisan. And someone has to kind of define what that means. And Biden has tried. I will I will give him that. He's given a number of speeches on democracy, but he just hasn't really succeeded. And the Democrats, you know, similarly, you know, do they have a charismatic leader in the Senate? Chuck Schumer? Not really. Again, somebody with good legislative skills, I think, but um, not really that person. Maybe Hakeem Jeffries, the minority leader in the House, steps into that role. Um. But it, it's tricky. I mean, and I think what like, Newsom, go ahead. Uh, California's Newsom as a potential uh, yeah. Democrat leader in, in the future. Well, even this year, some was, people are talking about, okay, if Biden steps down, then Newsom could come in. Um, I'm just going to talk about Newsom. 
So, and I, I don't know, you know, necessarily a ton about about Newsom, but this goes back to the federal nature of American democracy. <laughs> and you know, Newsom is governor of California, and it's not. You know, not that governor of California has never been president before. That was Ronald Reagan's uh, resume as well. But at a time when kind of holding together a national pro-democracy coalition is especially tricky, I think governors are in a a challenging position. And it's notable that when Democrats have presidents who are governors, it's been Bill Clinton from Arkansas and Jimmy Carter from Georgia. So it's been Southern Democrats. It's been a way of kind of thinking about pulling together a moderate coalition across different kinds of states. And someone from California, fairly or not, is going to symbolize a particular segment of the Democratic Party. And it's not just that Newsom can't do it, but he has to, I think, view that as his primary job. Not being, you know, not getting barbs in against Ron DeSantis. Democrats agree they all hate Ron DeSantis. That's not hard, right? It's... um. It's then looking at the the kind of pain points in the coalition and thinking about how that how that all gets assembled together, including not only including Democrats in maybe less culturally liberal states, but also including disaffected Republicans who are a key part of the of that pro democracy coalition. So I think those are the problems with Newsom. And we have a real tendency to overemphasize candidate characteristics and say, well, Newsom, you know, Newsom has good hair. He does. Um, but it, you have to really think you have to really break down what the coalition is and think about it that way. That's fair. The Democrats have kind of lost the, the working class. I mean, is, is that is that fair or not? Or is that just uh, an easy trope to, to throw at the Democrats? Well, you're you're missing the key word in when we talk about the Democrats missing the work the working class, which is the white working class. Okay. Um, if you if you define blue collar by occupation or by income, the Democrats win, and they win because that segment of the electorate is heavily, I think, forty percent or so uh, black or Latino. And so, when we're making these arguments in the United States, the other thing, other than everything, comes down to state election policy. The other thing is everything is never very far from race. And so that's really sort of the question. Have, you know, have Democrats lost votes with white voters? And the answer is yes. Um, you look at, if you look at that trend since the, the 60s and 70s, that's true. Um, that white voters have, have gravitated to the Republican Party. And then you say, okay, well, this is, you know, approximately 70% of the electorate. Not everybody in that group is the same. Of course they're not. And over time, um, actually not sort of over time, but also in sort of a watershed in 2016, the big change is the movement of non-college educated white voters into the Republican column. So yeah, that's true. And Democrats used to be competitive in rural areas, and they no longer are, for the most part, um, in areas that are predominantly white. So it's, I mean, you can phrase that as Democrats have lost the white working class, or you can phrase that as the political system has brought racial questions to the fore and then let them just sort of fester and bubble and rile people up as opposed to trying to solve them, which is how I, I'm sort of, I'm skipping over a lot of history and facts here. But that's sort of how I see it is like, this is, has to be a multiracial democracy. And everybody has to be kind of given their their due and everybody has to be treated equally. And that means that you can't elevate the interests of one segment of working class voters or voters in general um, and then expect for that to to work out. I guess the last thing I'll say about that is that there are still a substantial number of wealthy people that vote that vote Republican contrary to stereotypes. And I think some of this, some of the emphasis on the white working class is an emphasis on kind of blaming people who haven't gone to college for the Trump phenomenon and people who have gone to college or have higher incomes have also voted, um, have also voted for Trump. So that's, I think, really kind of a, a critical element. So each of these, each of these demographic claims has a, a long history, essentially. 
And and in terms of policies that were Biden, and we'll talk about chances of winning uh, towards the end of this conversation, but were Biden to win another term, what policies would he try to implement? Yeah, that's a good question. And it kind of depends on Congress. It kind of depends on the composition of Congress. And the Senate map does not look great for Democrats. So it's not terribly likely that he'll have another round of unified government. It's possible. Um, you know, if that's the case, if he's dealing with divided government, you know, it's it's hard to say. I think I think Biden has had some success with um, with pursuing an economic agenda that's found some common ground with Republicans. I think you might be likely to see some more protectionist trade type of things. That seems to be an area where both parties have moved in a more populist direction. Um, I'm not an economist, so I can't really speak to the, the wisdom of these policies, although I admit that I'm a little taken aback um, by how quickly both parties have moved in this direction. That seems like a possible area of, um, of bipartisan agreement. I think that the administration will continue to use what they've essentially done is use the rulemaking process in the Department of Education to forgive student loans, particularly of people who are working in um, in public service. So I think that will be, I mean, the second term agenda under divided government is usually pretty limited. Yeah, understood. Now, let's move on to Trump. Um, I mean, the first question is, I mean, how do all of these court cases affect his re-election chances? It's it's really hard to know. Um, it seems like they've helped his standing in the Republican Party. But it's important not to conflate Republican primary polls with general election polls. And I know that your your listeners would never do that, but you do see that sometimes here in uh, in the U.S. I think people have a tendency to have, you know, maybe difficulty separating those things. I think that it, it has sort of allowed the party to rally around him. But I think for other people, again, it's all about kind of cobbling together this coalition. And both Biden and Trump have proven in the, in the elections that they won that they sort of need everybody in their coalition. They can't afford to lose anybody. And I think for Trump, just having these runs the risk of losing some of the more mainstream Republicans or independents who supported him in 2016 and were his sort of crucial electoral college margin. Um, polls suggest that a conviction would really hurt him. Which, again, you think about the people that cast the decisive votes in elections. They're not necessarily committed partisans. They're people who pick up bits and pieces of the news. And they may not have thought about it very deeply, but this sort of idea of the president being convicted felon, even if his sentence is suspended or whatever, they may not they may not care for that. You know, they know what all of those words mean. And that's sort of what we're seeing. So I don't think it helps him a lot in the general. And I also think that again, on the heels of his surprising win in 2016, that we shouldn't confuse a surprise with an overwhelming majority. Trump lost the popular vote. He has never commanded a national majority. That could change. Uh, everything is subject to change. But that's sort of the, the baseline we're operating with. And uh, you know, one of the uh, concerns many people have or they've raised, and Trump himself has indicated this about uh, dictatorial power, is mm -hmm. that were he to be reelected, he'd essentially, um, you know, act like a dictator, you know, um, mm -hmm. start to um, uh, attack people who aren't loyal to him, go after sort of Democrats and liberals and so on, using mm -hmm. sort of excessive, sort of, you know, power in different ways, you know, risks of civil war, you know, you know, people are really kind of pushing the, sort of the boundaries mm -hmm. here and what could happen. What, what were your thoughts on this? Well, I think that there's there's kind of two areas where presidential power has been allowed to really to build up pretty substantially. And one is in um, the kind of staffing of the executive branch. And so this is what we're seeing a lot of is, is kind of can the president fundamentally change the character of the Justice Department and appoint only people who are very loyal to him and for whom that's their main political identity and also tell them to to elevate prosecuting certain types of, of crimes or looking for certain things? And the answer is absolutely, right? The enforcement element of the executive branch is, is tremendous, and the president has a lot of power over what goes on in the executive branch. The other piece of this is that it's not that there aren't checks on each of these things, including 
some of those staffing questions. But it's that the president is in a position to move first and to move on his own. And the courts are reactive. Congress in that situation is going to be reactive. And it's also Congress in particular is going to be held back by its its procedures and the fact that it's just so many people who have to come to these decisions. So it's it's a collective body. That's, I think, what the big trick is for me is you can imagine a scenario, you know, I've heard people talk about this, where Trump has talked about suspending uh, birthright citizenship for people who are born here um, to, you know, to parents maybe who who don't have legal status. That is absolutely, I mean, the president under no circumstances can just declare a constitutional amendment inoperative, right? That's That has no legal legitimacy. The president can tell the State Department to do things, right? It can hold up people's passports. It can simply, and Trump did this the first time around, just not staff the State Department. It can do any, the president can do any number of things. And the system would absolutely have the authority to invalidate that and push back, but that would take time. And so there are many things that I think you might see where, as with Trump's first term, there's, you know, a, a fairly substantial amount of pushback. But that pushback will take time and people's lives will be affected in the interim. And so that's, I think, really what, you know, the way to, to think about that. And Trump would not be able to do everything that he says he could do. But the president has just a tremendous amount of um of institutional power in that context. And in terms of the opposition, I mean, because he uh, he's obviously has his rhetoric that Democrats are after him, you know, legally. So will he then go after her, the Democrats when he's in power mm-hmm. as well? He certainly could. Um, right. He certainly could. And you see this with, you know, he certainly could go after um, various people with with different prosecutions. You also see the sort of thing where, you know, everybody probably has a traffic violation or some sort of thing that they've done. Um, and so you might start to see that kind of thing of really prioritizing certain types of enforcement. And the, the reason that I bring that up is because I think that, you know, in our media environment, it's very easy to follow things that are bombastic and, and kind of sexy. Um, and it's much less interesting to say, well, you know, this, this, person and you've seen this happen at the state level actually this person who is a local journalist in kansas and it turns out they have a bunch of unpaid parking tickets or you know unpaid whatever and um parking tickets wouldn't be the department of justice but you know they find some sort of thing that they've they've done um and either you know ruin their lives with a bunch of kind of legal um legal trouble legal stuff or also the way that Trump has not shown a lot of compunction about naming private citizens and subjecting them to harassment. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of potential to, to ruin people's lives in ways that might or might not fly under the radar of the average person. Um, because we might be attuned to something like ending birthright citizenship or the ways that Trump talks about being a dictator, but there's actually a lot of very boring ways, um, that unchecked authoritarian governments make people's lives miserable. And, and one of the things, um, you know, that I've noticed is there, there seems to be much more organization in terms of potential policies Trump could implement. So, you know, his first presidency was quite disorganized. But if you look at, say, the Heritage Foundation, they put together something mm-hmm. called the Project 2025, with a whole mm-hmm. bundle of, of policies to make the U.S. more conservative. And many other think tanks have done something similar as well. So there's things that seem to be much more well thought out this time. Does does that, you know, affect? Uh, I mean, do they matter, these sorts of things? Does it, does it mean that uh, a second term by Trump could be much more um, effective in terms of execution than it was in the first term? I mean, there's certainly the organization matters, the staffing matters. Um, I think that there, there are a couple of things. So I do think that matters. I think there are a couple of other things, though. One that I think, one question that I think is pretty open there that has to do with his relationship to think tanks and that kind of thing is whether he'll be able to to sort of appropriately staff up. One of the things that really stood out to me in 2017 was that a lot of kind of high level people and co- you know people with competence and experience did not want to join the Trump administration, um, and you know many of them also left. But there was because Trump was so controversial, and also because I think he had been elected without a plurality of the vote. 
there was a sort of political stigma attached to that in some circles. So it'll be interesting to see if that happens it, this time around, if he's if he's elected again, um, you know, will Heritage be able to, for example, supply him with people who have legal expertise or foreign policy expertise, technical expertise to implement some of these policies? Um, that that's a big open question. Or will he just sort of be, you know, he's recruiting people and then he's tweeting about them, and you know, that doesn't make for stable. White House staff. His uh, White staff House retention staffing. track record is not very good. Oh, not very good. Right. And yeah, the retention track record is not good. And also just the sort of attraction of talent. The other piece that is, I think, crucially important is in the event that Trump were to win similarly to how he won in 2016, without a majority, how how effective a check is a is a pro-democracy majority in that situation? And it seems like it should be a pretty effective check. And I know, for example, in your system, it probably would be. But in in the United States, I think we're increasingly seeing a dynamic where you have a really well-organized political minority on the right that has a lot of money and that has, you know, a lot of kind of organizational teeth behind it, things like like heritage. And then not that you don't have money and organization and think tanks on the left. But a much more diffuse majority that ranges from everybody from, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to someone like like William Crystal or his other kind of, you know, David French, he's disaffected Republicans. And a, a diffuse majority is a very <laughs> slippery tool in the American system. And, you know, if it's able to work its will through Congress and the courts, that's, you know, in public opinion, those are all um those are all pretty big questions. So that's really that's really where a lot of my concern is, is sort of, you know, assuming that this pro-democracy majority holds up, how does it how does it form an effective check on a potential second Trump administration, but also any number of other other policies that we're, you know, that we're dealing with and experiencing, also a Supreme Court that doesn't necessarily see itself as as accountable. I think that's that's kind of the the question of American politics today. And in terms of policies for Trump, was he, were, were he to win, one would be he'd presumably do something on immigration and even, you know, uh, people who were born in the US. Um, are there any other sort of key planks of policy you think he'd be really keen on pushing through? Yeah, these are all, these are good questions. I, um, I mean, obviously it will be immigration. I think he'll also probably implement some fairly standard Republican economic policies, and that was sort of the playbook last time. Some, you know, the kind of more tax cuts, um, kinds of um, kinds of policies. But you know, I don't know. A lot of the focus has really been on either immigration, um, maybe more, maybe more uh, stuff on federal crime, a federal crime bill. And I should note that in our system, it is. Um, it is really notable when there is federal crime legislation. It has happened under both Democratic and Republican presidents, but you know criminal issues have typically been dealt with at the states. So to have federal criminal legislation is is a, an expansion of uh, federal power in a fairly serious way. That would be another one, and that's one where Republicans have a bit of an advantage, um, where yeah. people see people see crime as being really high right now, and it just isn't. Um, yeah, but that's yeah. That's the now. Now, in terms of the actual election results, I mean, you know, Trump is leading the polls at the moment. You know, obviously, it depends on the electoral college sort of makeup and so on. So the polls aren't doesn't map in you know straight one to one, and we're quite far away from the election itself. Um, I mean, do you have uh, a view on who's going to win? I mean, I think it's it's likely to be close. It's almost always close. It will probably depend some on the campaign. And I do think that there has been a sort of situation in which a lot of people aren't really paying that much attention, and a lot of um, a lot of the things that have been a little bit of a hindrance for Trump and for a uh, kind of Trumpist Republican Party are likely to be at the forefront of the public conversation. Uh, really, starting with um, with democracy and January sixth, and maybe also with. Uh, abortion politics. That's been kind of a confusing one. There's we keep getting these little anecdotes that say people hold Biden responsible for the end of Roe v. Wade because he was president when it happened. So we'll see how Democrats, if they are able to um, make that 
you know, make make that messaging clear. But I think that the campaign is actually going to matter because it's likely to be close. And so it'll matter what issues get emphasized. Another way to put it, I was thinking about this last night, is that if the election is mostly retrospective. That gives an advantage actually to Trump because other than the, the very big caveat of the pandemic and January 6th, the first three years of Trump's presidency were actually pretty good for a lot of people. Um, the economy was was pretty good, all of that kind of thing. Biden's presidency has been very rocky in terms of people's day-to-day living. So, you know, I think that a retrospective narrative will will advantage Trump. I think a prospective narrative will advantage Biden. And that's where, you know, making an election prospective is, I think, quite challenging. But in this case, I think quite important because as you pointed out, there have been there has been some learning in in the Trump camp. And it's likely that this, that a second administration would look quite different than the first in ways that are um, at odds with some of the the values of our system. Yeah. OK, that's excellent. Now, we could carry on talking. Uh, so but let's let's uh, put a stop there and let's round off with uh, just one or two personal questions. I just wanted to ask uh-huh. to, to round things off. One is um, many of our listeners are young and some of them will be u- leaving university and college this year. What advice would you give youngsters leaving university as they enter the wide world? Yeah, so I have, I have kind of two related pieces of advice that I give my students. And one, and this is counter, I think, to everything everybody told me for the first 18 years of my life. And one is to actually trust yourself a little bit more as you're picking a career and thinking about what you're, you want your life to look like. You probably have a good sense of how you like to spend your day. And this is a great time as you're leaving university to test some of those theories and find out what kind of environment you want to be in. And to really trust yourself, if you're if you're thinking, I'm not cut out for nine to five in an office, I'd like to work with people or work outside or anything else that that's, you know, that's valuable and useful information. And if you trust yourself at this point in your life, you'll probably be a lot happier with those decisions um, later on. And the kind of related piece of advice is that up to this point, you've always been working toward the future. Everything has been about preparing for college or preparing for law school or preparing, preparing for a job or whatever. And it's actually worthwhile to think about what do you want to do right now? And what do you want to do for the next three to six months or the next five years? And not net, where do you want to be in five years? But what do you want to spend the next five years doing? I think it's especially important in your 20s when you have a lot of energy and a lot of options. And in main case, it's not a lot of commitment to really think about what is it, you know, what is it that you would most like to do? And the chances that that will actually take you to where you want to be in five or 10 years, I think, are much higher than we often um, we often think. So this is sort of my counterpoint to everybody saying plan, plan. I mean, I'm not saying being reckless. <laughs> you want to, you know, they save money and make make good choices, but also really think um, seriously about what it is that you want for your life and, and take that seriously and try to tune out some of the messages about what you should want to do. And that's excellent advice there. Um, and then um, in terms of books, what's what some of the books that have influenced you over your um, over your uh, academic life? Oh, this is such an interesting this is such an interesting question. Um, I'm going to start with a with a non academic book which is The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson. It was about the Great Migration. And this book, I think, really changed the trajectory of my academic life because it really made me start to think about the importance of, um, of race in American politics in a new way. And, you know, from that, um, from, from there, I've tried to incorporate that into my studies of, of parties and the presidency. What's another... Um, the kind of foundational one that probably a lot of presidential scholars of my my vintage will say is one of my graduate school advisors, uh, The Politics Presidents Make by Stephen Skoranek, which is this sort of cyclical theory of presidents in time. Um, I feel like there's got to be um, a bunch more, but. Uh, I'm sure there are, but these the are good enough, too. to be honest. Yeah, They're two very yeah, good books. Great. I haven't actually it read the great. first one, The Warmth of the Suns, but I have read the uh, the Presidential right. Time one, which which is a classic and, and you know, very thought-provoking. Um, yeah. 
And, and just to round things off, what, what's the best way for people to follow you? Um, I don't know. With, <laughs> with, the, with, the decline of, uh, with the decline of Twitter, I'm on Blue Sky. It's just my name, Julia Azari. Um, right now, I am uh, doing a bit of writing for, uh, for 538. I have written occasionally at Politico. I have a sub stack that's also just my name, Julia Azari. But I'm a little bit... Well, in finishing a book and in a little bit of a transition point in my in my public facing work, so um, hopefully on the blue sky, I can I'll let people know what my next my next adventure will be. Right, I'll include links to all of those that sources. So with that, thanks a lot for this fantastic conversation, and uh, I wish you a lot of luck uh, following U.S. elections this year. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please subscribe to the podcast show on Apple, Spotify, or if you listen to podcasts, leave a five-star rating, a nice comment, and let other people know about the show. We'd be super grateful. Finally, sign up for our free newsletter at macrohive.com forward slash free. That's macrohive.com forward slash free. We'll be back soon, so tune in then.